The prospect of war in Ukraine in the year 2022, by which we mean an escalation of a war that has been ongoing since the year 2014. The prospect of a new or expanded war in Ukraine is interesting for one reason and one reason only, and that is democracy. In as much as this war can be construed to be about democracy, in as much as the people who support the Ukrainian side can think of themselves as supporting democracy against dictatorship, against tyranny, etc., to that extent, you've got a war that is at least interesting. I just mentioned uh, it's very hard to be motivated to read primary sources from political history when you're looking at a continent, you're looking at an epoch, you're looking at a century, or you're looking at a millennium in which there is absolutely no democracy at all. Uh, you know, I've worked on politics and history of India, Southeast Asia, China, uh, but even England. You go back far enough, you're reading primary source documents about political history in India at a time <laughs> there's just democracy is not even thought of. It's just 100% pure, top down, theocratic monarchy. And it's really of, of very little interest. Okay. The problem with Ukraine is that it really is not a simple cut and dried case of the pro-democratic forces lined up against the anti-democratic ones. And that's that's why I'm taking the time to make this video. Now, I could throw out a whole bunch of disclaimers here. <laughs> you will note in the description of this video, I have a shout out to my rival and political enemy, Hassan Piker. <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't hate Hassan, but I mean, obviously we're in different parts of the food chain, literally and figuratively. <laughs> I mean, Cassandra and I have nothing in common politically. Uh, I have a shout out to Jimmy Dore. There are a lot of people on the left who, uh, for untranslatable reasons, support Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin has this very strange status on the left. I would say similar to Venezuela where people make excuses for and support Venezuela without really knowing why, without really knowing what, the, without knowing what it is they're concealing or what it is they're revealing. I remember only ever dealing with one of these people face to face once. And I was horrified. I was not prepared for it at all. I met a guy who was a vegan activist face to face. And he basically came out of the closet to me. He admitted and started talking to me about the extent to which he wasn't, he idolized and supported Vladimir Putin and, and Russia, present day Russia, not communist Russia, but Russia as it is today. And that he he regarded Russia and Putin as doing something positive in challenging and opposing American imperialism, American democracy. It is mystifying. It's difficult to understand. It's difficult to relate to. But that is a significant voice on the left. Now, you tell me, why isn't it a voice on the right? Why aren't conservatives pro-Putin? Why aren't the right wing pro-Putin? You can right now go with a lot of reasons why it would be the right wing and not the left wing supporting Putin, including religion, i.e. Christianity in this case, including supporting Christianity against Islam, supporting Christianity against uh, atheism, including homophobia, right? Putin has a very carefully defined position where he's he's not homophobic, but he is opposed to homosexuality. He's a He's anti-gay, but he's not quite going all the way to homophobia. You know, I'm not saying this to vindicate him. I'm, I'm pro-gay rights. I'm, I'm a very pro-homosexual person without being homosexual myself. I don't sympathize. I'm just pointing out in a parallel universe, in a science fiction universe, in some other universe, it's easy to imagine it would be the right wing in America or the right wing in England that sees Vladimir Putin as a positive symbol of the kind of society they, they won't have. I mean, who the hell thinks of Russia as it exists today? Russia Today, so to speak. <laughs> so it's the name of a famous YouTube channel, but Russia Today. Who thinks of Russia Today as leftist or left-wing or socialist? It's it's a truly horrendous example of, of corrupt capitalism, crony capitalism. Um, you know, with that being said, Russia deal, does still have some claim to being democratic and that's significant to the the topic of this video so look understandably since joe biden came into office 
we have been told again and again by the mainstream press that uh, the possibility of Russia invading Ukraine is in the future. And apparently the possibility is today, February 22nd, 2022. <laughs> apparently, apparently it's been declared today. War has been declared today, in effect, according to the, the Joe Biden administration's version of reality. There is absolutely no retrospect. There is no hint of remorse or reflection looking back to the Obama administration and the fact that Vladimir Putin already did invade Ukraine, already did annex large parts of Ukraine back when Obama was in power, not, not Trump. I mean, Trump, there were some small scuffles, but really the red hot bullets were flying. The really decisive period was the Obama administration. Hmm, of all the people who might have memories of what happened during the Obama administration, who might have regrets, who might have a critical perspective now in looking back at what Obama did right and what Obama did wrong. Joe Biden, <laughs> he's the most valuable witness to that history imaginable. Nobody could know more about what Obama did right and what Obama did wrong than Joe Biden. A apparently, we're, we're not going to hear it. So no, the, the propaganda narrative presented by the American press and I would note, you know, I listen to news from Japan. I listen to news from France. Once in a while, I get news from Germany. Uh, the other nations of Europe are not comfortable with the Joe Biden narrative. You know, I wouldn't say the Japanese are opposing it, but there's sort of some trepidation about buying into the current propaganda narrative. But the propaganda narrative is that this is a new, sudden problem of Russia invading Ukraine. Not that this is a, a, an invasion that took back took place back in the year 2014, that it's been ongoing, and that in reality, the people of Crimea and the people of a significant portion of the landmass of uh, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, uh, eastern Ukraine, that these people have been living under Russian dominion for actually a long period of time now. Uh, no retrospect, even no looking back to the Obama administration. You never once hear in the mainstream press under the Biden administration reflections on, say, the last 200 years of Ukrainian history. You never get reflections on, well, what percentage of the people in the east of Ukraine or in the south of Ukraine or in Crimea specifically, what percentage of those people consider themselves ethnically Russian? What percentage of them speak Russian as their first language, their primary language, or their only language? What percentage of them, if you had democracy, if they had a choice, what percentage of them would prefer to be a province of Russia rather than a province of Ukraine? And there's a third option here. What percentage of them would prefer to have a small independent country like Belarus, or like former Yugoslav Republic? I mean, some, some countries in Europe are really tiny. You know, there's no minimum size. Vatican City, you know, <laughs> Europe is full of uh, small principalities like this. You know, what percentage of them would prefer maybe to actually have an independent country? whether that be Crimea, Donetsk, Luhansk, or the, or the three of them together as one country, you know, then it wouldn't be that small. Crimea alone is, is not that small. There is no capacity to reflect on these things. Now, why? Because that erodes the narrative that this is a very simple confrontation between pro-democracy and anti-democracy forces. There are a lot of really important wars to be fought in the world that genuinely are about pro-democracy and anti-democracy forces that are really clear cut. You got North Korea and you got South Korea. Which side are you on? I'm on the pro-democracy side. <laughs> and that makes me pro-American imperialism. Very clear cut. Now for me, there's no ethical ambiguity there whatsoever. How about Taiwan versus communist China? I gotta say, I dislike Taiwan. I really, you know, you guys may not know me like that, I'm really not biased in favor of Taiwan in many, many ways. I know it's going to sound weird. I personally could have a better quality of life living in communist China than living in Taiwan. And I would know. I've tried. I've lived in both. There are a lot of ways in which I appreciate the accomplishments of the government of China. Someone who's lived there and studied it. I can say good things about China. I can say bad things about Taiwan. But if we're talking about democracy, you know, I'm 100% on the side of Taiwan. 0% on the side of China. It's a very clear struggle for and against democracy. Now, again, the other one, maybe you heard of this. 
Maybe even back when the newspapers were admitting it was a problem. For some reason, we don't talk about Hong Kong anymore. Hmm. Hmm. I wonder why. I wonder why no one is asking Joe Biden what he wants to do about Hong Kong. I wonder why. I wonder why that's not on the front page newspaper. I wonder why Cuba is not on the front page newspaper. Joe Biden just doesn't have any interest in democracy in Cuba. Again, completely one-sided when it comes to Cuba. I support American imperialism. I support American democracy. I oppose dictatorship. I oppose communism. Completely simple, completely cut. Uh, 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 what, what was that country where people were dying in the streets fighting for democracy? Uh, what, what was it? Myanmar. Yeah, Myanmar. Remember that? Uh, 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 how many pages deep do I have to go in this newspaper to find something about Myanmar and what Joe Biden's going to do? Ah, uh, for some reason, we only care about Ukraine in 2022. This is the only example of pro and anti democracy that that matters. Um, you know, when you think about when you think about Central Asia, when you think about the great chessboard of the world, is it um um Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan? You know what? Hmm. Actually, when you really start to think of it, hmm, <laughs> there are more and more places where you are looking at a completely stark struggle for the future of democracy, where it's very one-sided and where America's role can be and should be to clearly fight for democracy and against dictatorship. Another one is basically, I mean, Turkey in 2022 and any of the countries in North Africa that Turkey is ex extending its tendrils and do extending its influence. Oh yeah. Remember that Island that used to be part of Greece and is now a separate nation. Kupros. What if, whatever happened to them? You know? Yeah. Whatever happened to the tiny Island of Cyprus? If the United Nations cares so much about these things. Oh, I, I decided I wasn't going to let this degenerate into a rant about the United Nations, but, but for some reason, nobody blames the United Nations. Billions of dollars are wasted on this peace-preserving institution, the United Nations. Isn't this exactly what the United Nations is supposed to resolve? It's exactly what the United Nations is supposed to avoid? Nobody, I mean, seriously, the last time I looked at the United Nations' own YouTube channel, wasn't that long ago, a couple weeks ago, they were getting fewer views per video than I do. Like, they were getting so few views per video. And you can ask yourself, when was the last time you even saw those United Nations plenary sessions being quoted on the mainstream news, like a clip of it? Because it's very rare. It's normally when something really funny happens or really crazy happens. The North Koreans showed at somebody, like something really ridiculous happens. But let me tell you something. Every day, the UN is covering the claims and counterclaims. Like on a minute scale, uh, on this day, a particular village in Donetsk, Russian soldiers crossed the border. And then the Russians say, oh, those weren't our soldiers. Those were mercenaries who aren't in our employ. You know, you get these real details hashed out and, you know, so-called uh, human rights reports. And all so, look, in my opinion, if you haven't heard this before, prepare to be shocked. I believe the U.N. should be abolished entirely. At a minimum, countries like the United States and Canada should quit the U.N. and kick it off their soil and refuse to be a part of it in any way. But not only is the U.N. failing to make these things better, it actually makes them worse. But mysteriously, just nobody talks about this. Nobody's like, nobody's like, well, don't worry. It's in good hands. The United Nations is going to solve the problem. Nobody says that about Ukraine. Nobody says that about Myanmar. Nobody says that about Hong Kong, Taiwan. Nobody says that. I mean, one of the examples that the UN has been deeply involved in for decades, no one says that about the Turkish occupation of half of the island of Cyprus. Nobody expects that. So what do we expect of, uh, of the United Nations? Okay. So look, um, Ukraine is interesting because it leads us to question the future of democracy. And it leads us to question specifically and narrowly the significance of fighting wars for democracy. Uh, <laughs> now, just in the last couple of years, since the year 2014, Ukraine has tried to represent itself as a profoundly committed pro-democratic nation that is facing off against its tyrannical larger neighbor, that Russia is this you know, horrifying, overbearing, tyrannical, anti-democratic nation, Whereas Ukraine is a pro-democratic nation, therefore, won't you please support Ukraine? 
you have to have a bit of a long memory to realize that before the year 2014 and even during part of the year 2014, Ukraine was really in the same situation that Belarus is today. Ukraine was one of the most despised, most corrupt, uh, you know, Russian pu puppet states. I mean, their relationship to Russia was very much of, of master to servant. Now, OK, you know, get into the details, get into the weeds. Yes, there was some Ukrainian nationalism. Yes, certainly there was some turmoil within Ukraine about to what extent they were going to lean towards the West or lean towards the East. But, you know, it is just not the case that Ukraine was one of our closest allies or one of the nearest and dearest countries to Western Europe, let alone the United States of America. There wasn't any great warmth of, of feeling on the other side. Now, this does not excuse what Barack Obama did. And look, there's another point here. Why should it be Barack Obama's problem? Well, what the fuck did you think Germany was going to do about it? What the fuck do you think France was going to do about it? I mean, this is the reality of the world we live in. Do you think Angela Merkel was going to roll up her sleeves and say, not on my watch. I'm not going to let another Crimean war happen. And Angela Merkel was going to go out and call for a corps of volunteers and go from town to town in southern Germany and say, sign up your sons and daughters, fight and die for the motherland. Do you think Angela Merkel was going to ring the bell of war and say, this is it? This is a time to take a stand for democracy, or even at a lower level than democracy. This is a time to take a stand for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. I'm going to address that in just a moment, because I, I do think it's significant that those concepts of sovereignty and the inviolability of territorial integrity, they are, they are not merely separable from democracy. They're quite separate from democracy, and sometimes the two are even antithetical to one another. Like you have to deal with what matters more, democracy or an abstract notion of territorial integrity and sovereignty, that the territory is drawn on a map and no one's allowed to change that, not even if you have a referendum and 95% of people say they don't like where the borders are, they want to change it, right? Like borders are supposed to be a tool used by human beings, kind of not the other way around. I, I grew up in Canada. You know, <laughs> what is the future of Quebec? What is the future of Canada? And what, you know, it's just ridiculous to me to pretend that territorial sovereignty is something that exists for millennia or even many centuries without being amended or renegotiated, especially when you have democracy, when you have people being being able to, to vote on it, so and so. Anyway, uh, Ukraine in the year 2014 did not have the status that it has now. And it's, it's a carefully contrived status created through propaganda messaging and, you know, genuinely created through the, the political actions of the of the leaders of Ukraine and also of the Ukrainian people. So in the last couple of years, they have stuck out their necks and they have fought and died in the name of democracy. And they have made themselves into martyrs for democracy. But not too long ago, back in 2014, it would be just as ludicrous to talk about Ukraine this way as it would be to talk about Poland this way or even worse, places like Belarus. You know, it's like, well, what is, you're telling me Belarus represents democracy? I mean... Does, does Belarus have more or less democracy than communist China? Like on a scale of one to 10, how democratic? Yeah, this is, it was really a, a hopeless, despised corruptocracy that nobody wanted to support. Does this excuse the decisions made by Barack Obama? No, but it explains it. I just related to you how ridiculous it would be to imagine Angela Merkel going from town to town and ringing the bell for war and recruiting people and saying, hey, now is the time to be a hero. Now is the time to stand up and fight and die for the future of Europe's eastern frontier. But, but if not Angela Merkel, who was supposed to do it? Barack Obama was kind of tired of ringing his bell. He had a war in Afghanistan. He had a war in Iraq. He had a war, it's hard to define geographically, against ISIS, the Islamic State in the Levant, whatever you want to call it. You know, he had a war in Syria. He had multiple wars in North Africa he was involved in, you know, including but not limited to Libya, the war against Boko Haram, so on and so forth. And as I recall, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm slightly off on the timeline here, I believe he had already declared his so-called pivot to Asia. Now, sorry, if I'm wrong, I should look up the date when he first declared that. If he hadn't declared it, he was in the phase of wanting to declare it because he had that plan in mind before he went public with it. Now, very briefly about Barack Obama's pivot to Asia, you could say one of two things, either one. It was a plan for a fundamental change in American foreign policy that never happened. Or two, it was a plan for a change in American foreign policy that did happen, but it happened when Joe Biden was elected, in Joe Biden's first week in office or first couple months in office, that it was the change, that that was the change Obama envisioned at the time. We don't know. 
Uh, Biden himself is not coming out and saying that his foreign policy decisions are the same ones Obama wanted to do, but for some reason just completely failed to implement. So that's, you know, but at any rate, Obama was certainly thinking about shifting to a posture of treating China as America's main enemy and not these miscellaneous wars I've just mentioned. Obama failed to do that. We don't know why. Uh, why did Obama never follow through with the uh, so-called pivot to Asia, which really can be glossed as the, the pivot to being anti-China? Now, this raises other interesting questions that we don't need to get into in depth here in this video. If China is your enemy, do you really want Russia to also be your enemy? Now, wouldn't, wouldn't you prefer to do what Donald Trump tried to do, totally incompetently? Don't get me wrong. Donald Trump was an idiot. But Donald Trump tried to embrace Russia while making an enemy of China. Wouldn't that be preferable? Do you really want Russia and Iran and China to be your enemies simultaneously? And we can keep going here. It's a long list, right? Well, you know what Obama did about Ukraine in plain English, jack shit. So Obama let it happen. Should we blame Obama more than we blame, uh, you know, the leader of France, the leader of Germany, the leader of England, the you know anyone, uh, the leader of Switzerland? You know, for real, no one, no one expects the Swiss to pick up the bag. You know, there are a lot of other countries here that are just geographically, culturally, and economically closer to Ukraine. And I think it does just reflect the overall contempt everyone had for Ukraine when the Euromaidan protests began. Um, nobody felt that Ukraine was their friend. Nobody felt they wanted to stand up and fight and die for the future of Ukraine. So now we get back into the question of democracy. Here's the problem. Some percentage of people in Kiev, Kiev, however you want to pronounce it, some percentage of people in the capital city of Ukraine are willing to fight and die for the future of Donetsk, Luhansk, Crimea, to, to maintain, in this sense, its territorial integrity. I don't know what percentage that is. I don't know. And some percentage of people in the capital city are willing to admit, look, the vast majority of the residents of Crimea do not want to be a part of Ukraine. They either want to be a separate country, a small separate country like Belarus, et cetera, uh, whatever, Estonia, I mean, compare it to the size of Estonia, you know, or they want to be a province of Russia. Russia did hold a referendum that everyone says was illegitimate and phony and staged. The referendum showed 95% of the population of uh, Crimea wanted to be part of Russia, not Ukraine. Well, talk to experts. I even look at interviews with experts. Nobody believes the number 95%. What do you think the real number is? Is it 75%? It's a very high percentage. In re talk to anyone involved in this and also kind of pay attention to the propaganda messaging. This is strangely not dealt with and, and avoided. A significant percentage, I've, I've, just being real with you, I have never heard anyone doubt that the majority of the residents of Crimea do not want to be part of Ukraine. They instead want to be part of Russia or be a separate country entirely, but that would be in a very close dependent relationship with Russia. That no doubt the vast majority of the residents, they want that. What percentage of the people in Donetsk, what percentage of the people in Luhansk feel the same way? Now, what I hear in the mainstream press and what I hear directly from national leaders, you know, not just America, England, the leader of Ukraine himself, so on and so forth, what I hear is an attempt to make this an argument about the inviolability of territorial claims and sovereignty. That, you know, well, uh, if anyone tries to change the border of any country, if anyone tries to take one country and split it into two parts or three parts, that that is a crime against humanity and has to be opposed. And they don't even mention the possibility. What if 85% of the population want that? What if it's 95%? What if it's 75%? So in Canada, this is normal. We have to deal with this. In the United States of America, if you've ever been to Texas, 
There are Texans who will tell you all the time, we used to be a separate country. Texan, Texas was not always part of the United States of America. And we can be again. Texans really hold it in their back pocket that if they ever dislike American politics enough, they can secede. They can become a separate kind of medium-sized country. Texans see it that way. I'm, I'm not joking. <laughs> and, um, you know, yeah, territorial inviolability and sovereignty. George W. Bush didn't have a whole lot of imagination. Um, how do you think the war in Afghanistan would have gone if it had been divided into about four countries after it was conquered by the United States? About, about four. You can get into it. It could be three, could be five. But, you know, Afghanistan has several different languages in several different ethnically distinct regions. Really, really Afghanistan could have split into a couple of different countries. And there was certainly an argument that the American war in Afghanistan would have gone better with the attempts at creating democracy in Afghanistan would have gone better. I mean, one of the prerequisites of democracy, especially in a country with a low level of literacy, a low level of education, can you understand the language the politicians are speaking? Can you actually read the same newspaper? Or if you're illiterate, have someone else read it out to you aloud? Do you have one radio service? It's a tough guy. <laughs> so, you know, this pretense that it's just unthinkable that anything on the map is going to be withdrawn, uh, going to be redrawn. Um, you know, now, especially in the case of Ukraine, if you guys don't know the term, I do see your comments coming in, but guys, if you have a second, hit the thumbs up button, it helps more people see the video, it helps more people see the video while I'm recording, also helps them discover it uh, later. But I do see your comments coming in. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Um, look, I used to live in Laos, a tiny country in Southeast Asia, just north of Cambodia, just west of uh, Vietnam. I used to live in Laos. And when I first got there, I felt that this was a tiny, poverty-stricken nation where the people were so tough that they had resisted being conquered by Thailand. They had resisted being conquered by France, which to some extent they were conquered by, by the way. It's a long story. But, you know, and they had resisted being conquered by the Japanese. Again, the capital city was conquered by the Japanese. Long story. Japanese army was there and did occupy it. But anyway, you know, this is this long history of resistance leading up to this surreal war with the United States of America, where the poorest people in the world were fighting the richest people in the world, jungle to jungle, cave to cave. Think, wow, these are these poor, you know, just backward, illiterate people. But they fought so hard for their independence. They sought, fought so hard to have, you know, sovereignty, self-determination, and this, this, to have this territory, this little piece of land. You know, obviously I felt nothing could be worse than to kind of say, oh, this country has no, no reason to exist at all. Like this should just be another province of Thailand. You know, I, it, like in a weird sense, like I'd done the reading. I'd done a lot of historical research. You know, it, it hurt me. Now, I was learning Laotian at that time. I did get quite far in my ability to speak, read, and write Laotian. And then I could speak Thai well enough. This is the point I'm getting to. You'd learn to kind of switch just a few words and get by in Thai. And Thai people would be able to tell. They'd normally think you were married to a Laotian woman. It's so like, oh, you're speaking Thai, but like your accent and a few words here and there give away that really the language you know is, is Laotian. Um, you know, I encountered people in Laos who had the down-to-earth attitude, look, there's no reason for this country to exist. There's just no reason for us to be a separate, independent country. This is ridiculous. Like, we're locking ourselves into poverty, and as it happens, an anti-democratic, horrible, communist, dictatorial regime. This is also true of Laos. But, like, that there is really no reason why Laos shouldn't have the same status than Thailand that Chiang Mai has within Thailand, any of the culturally and linguistically distinct units within Thailand. And, you know, again, at first, it's, it's just kind of shocking to me. You learn the language more and more. And you start to realize the extent to which Laotian is a dialect of Thai or Thai is a dialect of Laotian. I've given you the word, uh, the term Swadesh list. You can get the Swadesh list for Thai and Laotian. Swadesh list is just a type of vocabulary list. And it's used to evaluate how different uh, languages are or how similar they are. Um, whether this is scientific or not is another question. Anthropologists like to use this particular list of words. Okay, so look at the Swadesh list for Thai, the Swadesh list for Lotion, consistently transcribed into the same phonetic notation, you know, so that 
it's not just the style of writing that's deceiving you. It's that similar to these are almost the same language. Now, no matter how much suffering there has been in history up to this point, no matter how many wars they've fought, how much they've suffered and died. Okay, so now it's the year 2022. Do you want to fight and die for the future of the Lotion language? Do you want to fight a war? Do you want to fight and struggle and die for the minuscule difference between the Laotian language and the Thai language? Now, we have another kind of problem here because Laos is anti-democratic. And the question becomes, do you want to fight and die for this horrible dictatorial anti-democratic regime just to prevent this country from being absorbed into a more democratic one, becoming a province of a country where they would have elections, they would have freedom of speech, they would have some of these benefits. Thailand, <laughs> Thailand has political problems. Okay, it's not paradise. You know, it does. But when you're comparing it to a communist dictatorship like Laos, you know, now this is not even getting into the economic aspect. Obviously, look back at the last 50 years. There is no way to exaggerate how much better off the people of Laos would be, their quality of life, their economic position, their level of education. They would be so much better off today in every way if 50 years ago they'd become a province of Thailand, if 100 years ago they'd become a There is no debate about that. None. Right? So you know, the, the unthinkable starts to become thinkable. Why does Canada exist? Why does Quebec exist? exist you know and what are the real disadvantages of canadian independence you know what are the real disadvantages of Quebecois independence i used to live in scotland when i was a kid uh, about 12 13 years old i think I, I think i turned 13 while i was in scotland um it was, i was there for more than a year you know i went there for whatever reason with this assumption that all scottish people wanted to fight and die to make scotland an independent country again and it was very hard for me to accept that no the majority of scottish people not the vast majority, but the majority, no, they preferred to be subordinate to London, England, that there were things that mattered more than independence. They didn't particularly want to have their own country and have their own army and have their own money, have their own currency. They were fine just having their own soccer team, just having their own football team, as they'd say there, you know. They were fine, you know, having this limited, symbolic kind of independence. And, and being a part of a larger unit. So if you don't know, in the years since then, the years since I was in Scotland, they have had a lot of polling, but also outright referendums. They've had democratic votes. They've had ple plebiscites to ask the question of what percentage of people want to be a separate country anyway. And a whole lot of people say they'd rather be able to ride a train continuously between you know London and, and Glasgow. Okay. So that is the reality of the world we live in. All right, it, It's just ridiculous to pretend that uh, sovereignty, uh, <laughs> uh, territorial integrity, that these are permanent, inviolable, non-negotiable concepts. Um, I'm going to come back to the Swadesh list. I defy you. Take a Swadesh list of the Russian language. This is a list of vocabulary. Put it next to the Swadesh list for Ukrainian. All right. Ukrainian and Russian are different languages. But they are so similar. You could be excused for saying Ukrainian is a dialect of Russian or Russian is a dialect of Ukrainian. The difference between the Thai language and the Laotian language, same, same. Um, do you want to fight and die for Ukrainian nationalism? Not just, I mean, you, would you sign up to fight in that army because of the abstract idea of Ukrainian nationalism and not Ukrainian nationalism for people in the capital city, Kiev or Kiev, whatever you call it, not to defend parts of Ukraine where perhaps the majority of people want to continue being this independent country, Ukraine, but to impose Ukrainian nationalism over Crimea an area where we are all absolutely certain the majority of people do not want to be part of Ukraine. Currently, this is not a problem in Canada, but it could be in future. It could be for Quebec, and it could be for some of our First Nations people. 
you could have a territorial area where the indigenous people say, look, they really don't want to do this Canadian thing anymore. They want to be a separate country. I know we can roll tanks. We can go conquer them and force them to be part of our country. But if you believe in democracy, and it's a question of how much, like how local does democracy get? What if there are some indigenous people in Canada and they would prefer to be a small country like uh, Andorra? Andorra is a tiny country. They say, look, it would mean so much to us. We're really committed to this. We really, even if it locks us into poverty and we have all these disadvantages, we'd rather be a tiny country like Andorra than be part of this Canada thing anymore. Well, do you respect that? How does, you know, <laughs> if the only justification for war in Ukraine now is that it is pro-democracy, we all need to think much more profoundly and seriously about what being pro-democracy really means. So yeah, uh, someone's asking if I'm still cooking this thing behind me or if it's going to burn. Great question. Great question. See that? Flatbreads. <laughs> oh, so do you want to give me a kiss? A regular commentator says, quote, what I found interesting is that nobody talks about the last five years. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, well, I think earlier on I mentioned that. It's it's just very suspicious that we don't want to discuss this in a retrospective framework of going back to the Obama administration. It's always and forever narrowed down to this very phony, very short-term uh, set of reflections. Okay. Now, look, guys. Um... <laughs> Great question from the audience. Quote, when's the last time you had caffeine? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> do, you, do you think I look high or do you think I look low? <laughs> I should do I should do a caffeine update video. This is true. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have not had coffee in many days. I had a small amount of chocolate today, uh, truth be told. So chocolate does contain caffeine, but I am I am off caffeine at the moment. Thank you for asking. My life is in many ways a long-term struggle against caffeine, but you know, sometimes to try to get my try to jolt my sleep cycle back on schedule. Or for other reasons, especially if I've been sick, even just the common cold, I like to use uh, caffeine to compensate. So, good, hard hitting questions from the audience. <laughs> um, you know, war for democracy, right? In Myanmar, you have a very straightforward situation where the majority of the people want democracy and are saying, wouldn't you please conquer us so we can have it? Now, this has its own moral quandaries, has some real serious moral problems. Conquering a people in the name of democracy when they do want democracy. I, I'm just being real with you, what percentage of Cuba want democracy? I don't know. You know, like I could, I could hear... I, is it 30%? Is it 80%? Some percentage of people in Cuba want democracy. Do they want it enough to stand up and fight and die? Do they want it enough to be passively conquered by the American army if the American people are willing to fight and die on their behalf? Right? You know, it's uh it's it's very tough. Sorry, so do you do you want to give me a kiss says, quote, Speaking from a country with four official languages, in my opinion, compromises are essential. So this is uh, Switzerland, everyone. Like. Romance was artificially created as a compromise between the values. So you have a standardized form of the, the Romance language. Um, yeah, in, in reality, Switzerland has like six official languages. You know, I, I know there's more than one way to count. But if you look at the number of languages that are taught in schools and supported by the government as official languages, it's, it's more than four. I forget if it's six or seven. But yeah, Switzerland is very big on on language education. And look, let's be real. I am not idealistic enough to say that Afghanistan can be Switzerland. I'm just not, you know, like, uh, like the fact that that's possible in Switzerland doesn't mean it's possible in Afghanistan. And, you know, I don't, uh, you know, it's so easy to preach virtue to the Yugoslavians, right? Well, Yugoslavia couldn't do it. Yugoslavia couldn't be a Switzerland in that sense, it couldn't be like Switzerland. And I, I just think it's unreasonable to, to take Switzerland. I mean, you know, Switzerland is a positive example in many, many ways. But to take that and then look at the rest of the world and say, well, why can't you guys all reorganize yourselves into Swiss republics? Uh, that is asking a lot. It's certainly asking a lot of, of Afghanistan. 
Um, anyway, look, to, to just kind of close the circle there, it's one thing to talk about conquering Myanmar with the hypothesis or the assumption that the people of Myanmar would like to be conquered, would like to be a democracy, and would accept uh, conquest as the price of becoming a democracy. All right. Well, right now, what percentage of the people of Crimea want the Americans to bomb them? If you could do a poll without any Russian interference, you know, I mean, if you could do a real, you know, you could have a magical, perfect poll, you know, where nobody feels any pressure and no, you know, where people are really asked their sincere opinion to think about it. And they know the answer is going to have real world consequences. You know, I think there are some people in North Korea who would say in a poll, yes, they wish the Americans would conquer North Korea to end this dictatorship. Some, is it 10%? Is it 50%? There are some people in North Korea who would say, look, this regime is so terrible. I wish the Americans would conquer us so we could just reunify with South Korea. Some, okay? Uh, there are probably some people in Cuba who feel that way. How many people really right now in Russian-occupied Crimea, how many of them would support an American invasion, an American conquest? of Crimea. If you had polling, if you had a, a referendum, I think everyone in this audience knows and everyone who works for the CIA knows and everyone with any shred of expertise knows the answer is very close to zero. There are almost zero people. There will be a few dissidents. There will be a few people who feel that Vladimir Putin's regime is so terrible that it's worth a nuclear war to get rid of Putin. There are. But there will be more people, certainly in the Crimea, certainly in Donetsk and Luhansk, there will be people who feel that they are Russian, that their language is Russian, that their long-term future is being a part of Russia, not Ukraine. And they probably feel that the dictatorship of Putin, electoral dictatorship, if you like, the strongman government of Putin, the corrupt, quasi-democratic government of Putin, as bad as it is, it will prove to be evanescent. Sooner or later, Putin will retire. Sooner or later, he will die of old age. And then without any revolution, we hope, without any civil war, Russia will be able to progress toward being a country that is more like Belgium. It's just going to be more of a Western democratic style country. That, that the, the norms, that, that the hope is that after Putin dies or after Putin retires, that they will not go further down the slippery slope to becoming like North Korea or uh, becoming like some of the Central Asian republics, some of these horrible dictatorships, that instead, once Putin has finished his you know, memorable career as the dictator of Russia, that Russia will you know, have a government much more like France, Germany, Belgium, uh, those normal standards. So that's a different kind of sacrifice, right? That would be people in Ukraine and people in, sorry, I have to specify, people in Donetsk, people in Luhansk, people in uh, the Crimea who are willing to endure a number of years or maybe a number of decades. Do you think Putin has 20 years left? Really? Is it 10 years? Is it just five? See, it's not that many years. It's not like you're enduring Stalinism. It's not that long. They say, well, we can tolerate being conquered and occupied by Putin imagining that a better regime, you know, is, is going to replace it. And from a completely uh, cynical perspective, you know, um, I, I think that is the basis for Donald Trump style optimism about Russia. Donald Trump style attempts to embrace Russia is that Russia is very different from North Korea. Russia is very different from Iran. Russia is different from Pakistan. Russia is different from, you know, the, the current government of Afghanistan, you know, the Taliban and so on. Russia is very different from ISIS, that there isn't really any fundamental basis for the amnity. Russia is a country that could be and should be our ally, could be and should be our friend. But uh, just due to this one tin pot dictator, just due to Vladimir Putin, temporarily it isn't. And... Is it reckless optimism to think that without a nuclear war, without a civil war, without a revolution, Putin can be replaced and Russia can return to some of the norms of, of Western democracy? 
So let's let's really get into this caffeine thing. I didn't have coffee today. I didn't have coffee yesterday. Day before yesterday, did I have coffee? I think maybe it was the day before that. I think this might be my fourth day with no caffeine. So you still are you still here, Scare Bear? I answered your question. <laughs> but yeah, I do. I do periodically struggle with uh, with quitting caffeine, and um, you know it's a struggle. It's a struggle worth having. I was talking to one of my neighbors the other day. I won't say who, but just someone else who lives in this apartment building. I think he's younger than me. I think he's like 10 years younger than me. You know, you know what I'm thinking about. Uh, he was just chatting with me in the hall. And, you know, I do struggle with physical fitness. I struggle with doing 200 push-ups a day. And I struggle with quitting caffeine. And I, I, I honestly, I cannot say I struggle with sobriety. I've been sober for so long. It's easy. That's not a struggle for me at all. I can't say I struggle with a vegan diet. And I've been vegan for so long, it's not a struggle at all, you know. But, you know, I'd rather have those struggles than, than not have them. And I wish I could say when I meet guys my own age, normally I'm meeting guys 10 years younger than me who look like they're 10 years older than me. And they're they're losing all those same struggles. I think it's fair to say just, just the last couple of weeks, I've struggled with video games. You know, I hadn't played video games in a long time. I got into, uh, as I made a video talking about, it, I got into buying video games for the 3DS before it closes. It's not worth it. It's a video game platform and it's going out of business. The store is being shut down. It's like, okay, are there any games I want to buy before this is gone forever? I got into really questioning, you know, which version of Pac-Man do I want to own? Not even that I want to play Pac-Man today, but that at some point in the future. And you feel that coming into your life and kind of taking up more space in your head and your emotional range. And on the other hand, you have things to deal with that are really heartbreaking and hard to deal with. Uh, my divorce, uh, talking to a lawyer about when I'm going to see my daughter, where I'm living, where I'm going to move to, what I'm going to do with my own studies and my own career. And the final steps in finishing the first book I've written, the first book for adults, No More Manifestos. I, I have been doing that, including clicking on the website so when you're making the book some of it's really boring formatting stuff um you know dealing with the book is stressful and then i started writing another book if you guys support me on patreon i started writing a new book and you know feeling the simplicity and childlike wonder of video games coming back in your life which again really has been part of my life i was joking with melissa about this at one point um uh you know melissa bought me a pac-man game it's not worth describing, but it's, it was a self-contained, what's called a plug-and-play Pac-Man game. And, you know, I did thank her. I guess, look, it's thoughtful. I know you bought this for me. But I refused it. I said, look, you know, do you still have the receipt? I really think you should return this because I'm not going to use it. That's true. At that time, I didn't even play, I didn't even play Pac-Man. And um, when Melissa and I first got together, the only game I played was Space Invaders, the original Space Invaders. And I do. I recently I bought a copy of Space Invaders. If I ever want to play Space, I haven't been playing it. I've played it for five minutes, but I do own Space Invaders again. These kinds of very very simple games that you can just play for five minutes here and there. You know. But I said to, I said to Melissa, look, it's so ironic. You you actually bought me as a gift that that Pac Man, and I I told you to return it. I was again I was nice about it. I didn't like say, oh, how could you possibly? But now here we are, like four years later, three years later. It's it's many years later. And if I, I you know, if I had that, you know, I, I'd really, uh, I'd really love it. I'd be like, oh wow, great. At least I have this, you know, way to play back then. So yeah, yeah, because yeah, I've, I've been going through that later. But anyway, yeah, you know, it's um, you know, I'm I'm saying this stuff out loud too because I've had a lot of fan mail lately. I just just be honest with you, some fan mail isn't uh, equally distributed over the years. Sometimes within a couple of days, I've gotten fan mail from people who really admire me. And they don't see the way in which my life is a struggle. And they don't see the way in which my life is a failure. So I really think it's important that I take the time to come out and say, look, guys, this is a struggle. This is a failure. This is hard. Uh, not to be self-pitying, not even to complain. But um, I think part of the reality of uh, performance art is that the performer makes the performance seem easy. You know, I'm coming on here and I'm joking about this. Uh, this is the first video I've ever done about Ukraine. I don't think the other video, I, maybe it's been mentioned very briefly in passing. Uh, but you know, how many hours of reading have I done about Ukraine between 2014 and present? And even how many hours have I spent just talking to Melissa, just talking to my girlfriend about Ukraine? I mean, you know, sorry, but if you actually tried to add it up, I mean, you know, like I say to people, like add up the number of hours you're spending playing video games. 
like if you actually had a, a tally. Now, in that sense, you know, a lot goes into it. And what you see is this very casual and joyous thing. And you don't maybe perceive, you know, this is someone who struggles to not drink caffeine. The reason being, what I like about coffee is it lets me get a lot of work done. That's what's appealing. It's not that it makes me happy. You know, like, okay, I can drink caffeine and then put 110% of my energy in this. That's what's appealing about it, especially if you've had a bad night's sleep or you've had a cold, you've been sick, something like that. If you're ill-rested, it's very appealing for someone who wants to, wants to get things done. To say, look, I struggle with that. And I struggle with the fact because I keep saying to people again and again, look, I have no employment. I have no hope of employment. All of my hopes for education have come to an end. You know, so I don't have to rehearse it here, but there were a series of university programs and college programs I was looking at trying to get into. And now all of them are over. I kind of have this brief distraction in buckling down and finishing writing the book. But then after I'm finished writing the book or these two books, plural, you know, there's this kind of chasm of what am I going to do with my life? And if you keep watching the YouTube channel, you'll you'll get to see that. OK, a couple more uh, questions here. Wicked Energy, who's a regular viewer. Uh, shout out to Wicked Energy. I hope that's not the name of a of a caffeine filled drink that I'm endorsing. I hope. <laughs> I think that's just this guy's username. Sounds like it could be a could be an energy drink. Says, uh, "quote Eisel, can you comment on if you think NATO is is overexpanding?" Oh, okay. So, so the question is 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 NATO going to expand further? You know, basically, what's the future of of NATO? Look, um, in reality the United States and Turkey are enemies. This whole thing with Russia has been a distraction from the extent to which the United States and Turkey today are enemies. So the most likely thing that will happen with NATO in the future is that it will shrink. It can't shrink legally. So what it will probably do is overnight, you'll have a, you'll have a meeting and uh, the members will be brought together. And, you know, NATO will be dissolved and then they'll form a new, a new uh, agency to replace it, a new military alliance to replace it. So you have two huge problems right now. One is Turkey and the other is India. So today in 2022 under Joe Biden, NATO, NATO makes no sense at all. NATO is a nonsensical. What's the word? NATO is a vestige of a bygone political era. If NATO made sense when JFK was president, it barely made sense. And kind of good luck trying to reason through how NATO got to the membership list it has today, the status of Turkey and NATO. But obviously, the real alliance that America needs to be a part of and, and set in stone is an alliance that includes India and Taiwan and Japan, and that excludes Turkey. So I wondered if you know, during his first 100 days in office or something, if uh, Biden was going to make a move of that kind, but apparently not, or apparently not yet. Now, look, um, so that's the big game for NATO, right? If you're going to dissolve NATO and start a new agency, a new security agency, a new treaty, a new, a new military alliance, uh, is it in America's interest to be arming small, powerless Eastern European countries against Russia? Not really. You know, what is in America's interest in Central Asia, including Afghanistan, but not limited to Afghanistan? What is America's policy on Mongolia? Mongolia, if you don't know, has an enormous border with Russia. And on the other side has an enormous border with China. Mongolia is a crucial strategic ally and you triangulate to Mongolia and Japan, you know, the army base in, in Okinawa, you know, uh, there were very, very serious decisions to be made there with serious long-term implications. But, you know, NATO as it exists today with Turkey at the center of it, um, it is a vestige of a, of a bygone era. So I, I can't see any other future for NATO other than it being dissolved and quite possibly on the same day ceremonially. You have, you know, America has a meeting with the countries that they want to be a part of the new agency to replace NATO. And they all sign a declaration or sign a document. Um, and then in some ways it it carries on. So, yeah, anyway, great. Some, so just a couple more comments and I'll wrap it up. Sleepyhead says, quote, I struggle with depression. 
you look so happy and your girlfriend as well. That is because I love life, you know, and, you know, I, I'm just being real with you. I think I'd be happy in prison. I think I'd be happy in the army. You know, if I could join the army, I'm too old. You know, I think I'd be happy uh, working a very humble job in an Amazon warehouse, which may be coming next. Tune in for season three of Abel Ciel where I'm working in an Amazon warehouse. You know, uh, I, my future, there is no possibility of me getting good or high paying employment. I may have very, very humble, hard, hard jobs in the future. But, you know, I am, I look happy because I am happy. And that's because I'm leading a meaningful life all the time. And put it this way, even if I'm not leading a meaningful life, I'm struggling to lead a meaningful life all the time. And that struggle is, is worth having. And that struggle, it makes you happy, you know, even when your life is terrible, even when your life is miserable, even when you want to break down crying because you don't know when you're going to see your daughter, you know, and, and you're only getting bad news from your lawyer and you're only getting bad news from the different government agencies you're trying to do paperwork with, you know, sure. I mean, there are a lot of things in my life that are very obviously tragic. And if you go back and look, um, <laughs> season three will be the wage slave arc. Well said, well said. The return to the workplace for Azul Mazar. Totally, totally. And I can come on wearing my McDonald's uniform. I look, that would be great. I mean, for me, that would be a fun form of content to do. You know? Yeah. <laughs> come in and talk about what life is like at McDonald's. Do some real kind of dark, dark humor about that. I can, I can see that, that coming for sure. Um, yeah, anyway, sorry, but you know, that, that's, that's a struggle worth, worth having. And, um, you know, I, I think you guys get the message. If you watch my videos lately, in large part, I'm out here trying to encourage people to embrace that struggle rather than embrace distractions from the struggle or deny, you know, and, uh, face up to what's making you unhappy and, and so on and so forth. Sure. Uh, so a couple more specific questions here. Question, uh, what do you do about Russia slash Putin, especially financially, since not militarily? And what does, what does Putin do next? So, look, guys, I, I, I kind of thought about saying this before. Um, it's, it's very different when you're in a position of power versus a position of powerlessness. So I, I'm not going to digress into a lecture on this, although I could. <laughs> thumbs up if you want a lecture on this. <laughs> Give the video a thumbs up anyway. <laughs> You've been watching for 57 minutes. Give it a thumbs up. <clears throat> when we talk about veganism, vegan politics, animal rights, what do you want to say? Ethics, ecology, global warming, any of those issues. 99% of what I'm saying is from the position of powerless people trying to change the world. It's, it's really kind of stupid and self-indulgent to sit here and say, oh, what would I do if I were the president of the United States about ecology, about animal rights, about, you know, the global warming. Now we, we can have that conversation, but it's the two are so far removed, right? So just, just making the disclaimer, most of what I talk about is from the perspective of an isolated intellectual, a powerless person trying to change the world in some way. And that's why I do ask questions. You'll notice in the middle of this discourse about Ukraine, I ask you to think, would you sign up to fight in this war? Would you be willing to fight for the future of Ukraine? And, you know, would you be willing to fight for the future of Laos in a war between Laos and Thailand, just because of the abstract concept of territorial sovereignty, right? Self-determination. These are these are questions worth thinking through because it, it situates you in that historical period in that struggle, you know, um, where there's something your own life is at risk ultimately, but at least at least a few years of your life are at risk. A lot of a lot of misery and discomfort and hard work. But that is again thinking view as a powerless person. It's very, very different if we were to talk about this in terms of what you would do if you were if you had been in Donald Trump's position. During that period of time, I have to say, I think it would be very tempting for the United States, for Canada, for England to say, look, we fundamentally embrace Russia 110 percent to say that they support Russia in its conquest of Syria. That's what happened, guys, in case you didn't notice uh, that just admit that actually it's kind of politically convenient for the rest of the world to just allow Russia to militarily stabilize some parts of Africa, some parts of the Middle East, and that actually that's kind of in the interest of, of Western businesses. They're not really our enemies because Russia also massacres members of ISIS. They also suppress you know, Muslim uh, jihadist extremist insurgency and so on. And to say, look, fundamentally, 
North Korea is our enemy and China is our enemy and Cuba is our enemy, but really not Russia. Like really, this is kind of stupid guys. And to embrace Russia 110% and say, look, we're going to start a whole new chapter of history in Russian relations. Donald Trump kind of hinted at that possibility, but never really went all the way with it. He, you could say he wimped out, but you could, you could totally, uh, you know, again, whether you think of that as idealistic or cynical, and you could say, look, you know, the temperament of just one man should not decide the fate of nations. It, Vladimir Putin is not our type of guy. Uh, but, you know, the Russian people really are our type of, we have no problem with the Russians. You know, as a people, they're really not our enemies. There's no reason to escalate this conflict. And it, it certainly, I mean, I just point out, if you were in a position of power, you could 100% embrace Russia. You cannot embrace Turkey. It's impossible. You cannot embrace Iran. It's impossible. You know, Iran is really your enemy, whether you like it or not. I mean, what you're going to do about Iran, that's tough. What you're going to do about Turkey, that's tough. This is really, really difficult stuff. What are you going to do about Libya? You know, but the whole thing with Russia, um, there really is a glasnost approach that's possible here. Unfortunately, one, history has been left totally in the hands of the American president. As I say, Angela Merkel wasn't going to do shit. What, you know, Angela Merkel isn't going to make, she doesn't do anything. Neither is uh, Macron now, you know, uh, Emmanuel Macron, Prime Minister of France. None of these other people are actually going to take any initiative. So it rests entirely on the president of the United States. Well, look who the president of the United States has been. George W. Bush, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and now, you know. So, yeah, from the level of elite politics and the level of, of being in power, that's a possibility. But from the perspective of powerless people, which is what I mostly talk about, of course, we should be 100% opposed to Vladimir Putin and we should support democracy. We should support democracy and oppose any kind of tyranny, any kind of non-democratic government, whether that is in Myanmar, whether that is in communist China or whether that is in Russia. Nice talking to you guys. When you look back at the last five years of your life, what have you done for democracy? Really ask yourself that question. You know, I'm going to, let's get a little bit more personal. When you look at your own father and the last 50 years of his life, what has he ever done for democracy? Look at your husband, look at your wife, whatever you got, boyfriend, girlfriend. In the last five years, what have you ever done for democracy? <laughs> and now look ahead to the next five years. And don't tell me, but really think about it. Really think in the next five years, what are you going to do for democracy? whether that is in Switzerland, Germany, Ukraine, Myanmar, Hong Kong, Taiwan, or in one state or another within the United States of America.